two, 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 and a mic. This podcast is brought to you by Briskby. Briskby makes you active. Tom McIntosh has been rowing since the age of 15 when he joined Lindisfarne College and Hawke's Bay Rowing Club. It didn't take long for Tom's talent to shine and he was soon selected in the 2014 Junior Men's Coxed Four. Since then, he has competed in Hamburg, Australia, Plovdiv, Poznan and Bulgaria, among other venues and tournaments. In 2019, as part of a Coxless Four, Tom and his crew won silver. In 2021, Tom competed in the men's eight at the Tokyo Olympics. Tom, thank you very much for joining me. I understand it's morning where you are. Obviously, it's a bit later where I am, but um, yeah, the, the wonders of technology are such that we could communicate live. Um, so thank you very much for joining me. No worries, Zach. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, normally, I guess the, the, the idea is to build up to a crescendo, but uh, you know, to hell with that. You, uh, you're a gold medal winner. I am. Do you want to see it? <laughs> Absolutely. I've got it here for you. Oh wow! Fantastic. That's an angel, is so it? The, uh, yeah. So that's um, Nike. The, she's a goddess of something. I'm not sure, but um, so they've got that sort of on all, all of them, and then on the back there's Tokyo 2020. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's an impressive disc, whatever you say. Um, how many times a day do you look at it? Um, it's just currently hanging up on the wall in the kitchen. So every time I get a cup of tea or grab a drink, I'll, I'll, I'll have a glance at it. That's one. I mean, how, how do you feel when you look at it? I mean, has it settled in? Okay. I know it's been a few weeks now, but how do you feel? Uh, feel good. It's all, it still is very surreal. I certainly don't think it has settled in yet. Um, it, it hit home a wee bit when we got welcomed home back into New Zealand after our managed isolation and we had, um, Heaps of school kids and friends and family coming to say good day and signing a few autographs and taking photos. So that was a pretty cool experience. Um, yeah, I never really thought it would happen, but it did, and and kind of here we are. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, you've won you've won medals before. I know you you won a silver medal before, but I mean, this is clearly a crowning achievement for you, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So I've competed at under 23 world champs and elite world champs um this is my first medal at elite level we had some bronze and silvers at under 23 level so yeah it certainly is a crown on the achievement um yeah i was just stoked that we could manage to execute our race plan on the day and it happened to be an olympic final and yeah we managed to cross in the first yeah i mean and you you beat the so the, your main competitors in the final were the germans and the brits if i'm not mistaken right yeah, and the Dutch as well, and actually the USA. And to be honest, everyone was um, had an opportunity to win, I guess. Uh, the Dutch had won our heat, so they were looking strong. USA were just behind um, Great Britain in their heat, so they were looking handy. And GB have shown consistent form throughout the season. So when we were lining up in the final, looking across at every crew, it was anyone's game. Anyone had the opportunity to take the gold medal on that day. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, how are the tactics as they so as the race develops? Because I mean, do you have a cox in the eight? Yes, yeah, so we have a cox, and he calls our race plan, and um, so it's his job to be the eyes and ears for us because obviously we're kind of maxing out physically, so we can't divert our attention to the other crews. Otherwise, you're not putting all your focus in your boat, and you need to be in an Olympic final. So our cox and Boz. Sam Bosworth, sorry, he tells us where we are in the race and, and how we're tracking and about, uh, it would have been sort of 1K to 1,100 metres into the race. He said, all right, boys, we're in the lead here. And when you get a lead in an Olympic final, 
and you're feeling good, that's just a massive confidence booster. And as athletes, you just, you've got that competitive edge. So you just want to keep going for more and more and more. And, and we did, and we took about, uh, in rowing terminology, three seats. So that's three people kind of thing. And I sort of could see out of the peripherals that we were in the lead and yeah, it just gave you that massive confidence boost. And yeah, we just kept pushing away and managed to hold off the sprint from the Germans and the, the Brits and yeah, we crossed first. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how much does your sort of training really kick in there? Because I can only imagine if somebody says, Hey, we're in the lead here, a, a sense of, you know, excitement perhaps will kick in, maybe push you a bit out of sync, but you, your training is just so on it. Isn't it in that case? Yeah, we're pretty well drilled in that sense. Um, you, do, you do get a big sense of excitement and adrenaline when you get in the lead, but it's important not to get ahead of yourself because this is the men's eight. It's not a men's one. You can't do things on your own. And if you start pushing out of sync with everyone, then that really upsets the rhythm and the boat speed. And with that, you're not going to get the speed return that you want. Although you're working harder, you're probably not going to be going any faster so it's important you just got to stay in the rhythm and just keep doing what everyone around you is doing and take confidence in that and trust everyone in your crew that everyone's fit everyone's good at rowing and everyone knows how to put the oar in the water and take it out and swing on it and we did just exactly that and when you get eight guys in unison moving like this there's nothing quite like it and it was just a such an awesome experience to be part of that and achieve that rhythm in the final Mm, yeah i mean do you sense a kind of connection in that because um, everything sort of works together as you say you've trained you've drilled you know um but then you're in you're in your zone aren't you so can you feel that kind of connection i mean do you do you have a certain point you fix your gaze to and you sort of focus on that point thereafter yeah exactly right so visually i'll just be looking at the um the back of hamish's head because he sits in front of me but for rowing you've got a lot of cues that sort of indicate you're in the zone so a visual cue the things look tidy in terms of the oars coming to the water i've got a, a audio cue uh, that's mainly at the finish of the stroke when the oars come out of the water and you can hear it go shook, shook. Um, so you can hear that and then there's just the mental and physical cue you can really feel the boat and you can feel the momentum of, of everyone in the boat sort of swinging like this and when everyone is in unison um, although we're rating about 38 strokes per minute and it's all it's fast and it's hot and there's a lot of energy everywhere time slows right down and things just become a lot easier when you're in unison and you can really be considerate of each stroke and think about how you're going to put your oar in the water and swing on it and yeah so with the unity comes a sense of ease and the best rowing races you will ever have will also be the easiest ones like not like physically the easiest but mentally it's just a bit more relaxing and you can really yeah be considerate of what you're doing and how you're taking the stroke yeah, yeah. I, I i can i mean i can only imagine i'm i'm so you know i am so far from the reality in which you compete in your elite field so i, I can't even swim so um but yeah i can <laughs> i can visualize i can kind of empathize uh, you know the, the way in which you 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 must train to reach that level so you know it, it's even more impressive for me because you know I'm useless in the water so um, I mean how hard do you train how many hours do you train so training is rowing is unfortunately one of the sports where you can't turn up on the day and expect to just get fitter or throw a Hail Mary you do <laughs> need to just put in a, a a massive amount of kilometers and aerobic training on the water so a, a big day training for us would be three sessions a day. It would be two hours of cardio in the morning, followed by an hour and a half of strength, condition, strength and conditioning session in the gym, followed by an hour to an hour and a half of cardio in the afternoon. So that's a big day of training. We might do two of those in a week, followed by um, uh, four other sessions where we're doing training twice a day. And unfortunately, the nature of the sport is you just need to put in those kilometers and aerobic work on the water because the way our race works, it's like a, um, it's a full noise sprint, but it's also not. You've got to sprint out of the start and then clear all your lactate. And then there's an expectation that you maintain boat speed right up until the end. And if you're not 
really maxing out at the start, then you won't be in a position where you can win the race because you just get dropped by the rest of the rowing field. So to be able to be competitive at that level, you do just need to put hours and hours on the water. Yeah, I could, I could imagine. I mean, and um, it was also interesting is, you know, reading a little bit about uh, the, the competitions that you've participated in and the disciplines. So there's, there's you, you, you started with the, the Cox four, if I'm not mistaken, but you also, yeah. you also moved into the Cox list four. So you didn't have the Cox Wayne there to direct your progress. How, how different is it for you to have or not have the Cox as it were? Um, it's, it's not like a massive difference and it's definitely something that you can adapt to. Um, the beauty of the Cox four is it's, it's kind of seen as a development boat here in New Zealand because it's often used at junior level and then under 23 level. And it just, it's good if you're a younger athlete to have a Coxswain because he can really gel your crew and make sure everyone is on the same page. But then as you progress through the sport and have a bit more experience and understanding of, of how to row and how to gel as a crew, um, you don't need a coxswain as much. Um, but yeah, and the coxless four is, is quite a cool boat because it's fast and it's, it's quite light because there's four athletes just rowing and there's a lot of power in it as well. But if you're, when you're rowing an eight, you have to have a coxswain. There's, there's no other way because he has to command the crew and he also steers the boat. And that's quite a um, stressful job when you've got eight guys hauling on, on an oar um yeah so that's a massive role he's got two strings that that moves the rudder and it keeps us straight because you couldn't roll an eight without a coxswain okay have you ever tried that uh no i haven't <laughs> oh to be the cox uh yeah occasionally after a race if we might like medal or something i might jump in the cox's seat and bark some orders at the boys and yeah <laughs> it's always a bit of fun it's it's a very small seat so if I do, my knees are up by my ears and I'm all cramped in there. <laughs> okay, so you wouldn't do it competitively then? No, not competitively, no. So just for reference, um, the coxswain needs to be 55 kilos uh, at a minimum and I'm about 88 kilos. So there's a bit of a weight difference there. It wouldn't work competitively. Wow, okay. So, I mean, we're talking about really fine details here. Um, and, and I guess this, this can tell the difference between victory and, uh, well, and the silver medal. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly right. So on the, on the weight aspect of a coxswain, it's very important that he's, he's on weight because one kilo extra in the boat, that, that could easily be half a second and that could be the difference between first and fourth. Wow. Yeah, as in, as in, yeah, okay, definitely when you're not completely aware of the details and the, the intricacies of a sport, then you know, these, these things are you're absolutely impressive. But uh, I mean, half a second between so many different places, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's stunning. That's a stunning feat, isn't it? I mean, it is, yeah. And it's, um, that's just the nature of the Olympics. Uh, this was my first Olympic Games. I've been to some world champs and they're, they're cutthroat and it's tight racing, but the rowing especially at the olympic games in tokyo there was nothing quite like it i saw races where people were in the lead with 30 meters to go and then they caught a crab which is when your oar digs into the water and it pretty much just stops the boat in its tracks so they went from a gold medal to a bronze medal in the space of 20 meters or or crews went from a silver medal with 50 meters to go to a fifth place because they caught a crab or another crew came through them so everything is on the line in the olympics and it's 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 cutthroat it's tight it's it's quite brutal in a way as well because people have spent a large majority of their adult life training for these events so it's everyone gives it the absolutely everything you know um and also for a lot of people if you win an olympic medal it's it's life-changing for you especially depending on what country you're from you, you could come back a superstar a superhero for your local club or your sporting niche or whatever um some governments give good financial incentives for athletes i think in singapore you get a million new zealand dollars if you were to win an olympic gold medal and a house so <laughs> it, yeah it's interesting in a way you it's it's a weird it's a weird thing because you train for so long and then you go overseas to the olympics and then you compete and you do well say you come back, nothing's the same. And it's, 
it's weird yeah you go away and then come back with this piece of metal and yeah your government gives you a million bucks in a house that's wonderful wonderful well i mean but when you consider the amount of training that you do i mean i i can't even imagine how you know, the the you know the the sacrifices you must have made to to be in that kind of physical condition to to be able to win that race uh, i mean it's merited any rewards that you receive thereafter it, it you know you thoroughly deserve it yeah yeah I, I guess that is true and we do put a massive amount of work in and um a massive amount of training into it i remember i would talk to some friends from high school and i'd tell them that we'd be training we could train up to five hours a day cardio and you tell them that and their jaw hits the floor but it's, it's just a different way of life you know i enjoy it you do get addicted to the exercise um obviously really enjoy rowing and I like the sport and I like staying fit so in that sense I'm just I'm happy competing and I like it um and anything else to me is just it's such an amazing bonus hmm. and I mean in the in the closed season do you find that you also have to watch your diet do you still have to maintain a certain level of fitness it's uh, you know I mean you can't really switch off can you too much yeah so certainly in the off season between world champs you need to maintain your diet stay fit you need to keep moving because you're, the Olympic Games is our pinnacle event, so you're always that's always in the back of your mind. Um, so yeah, the off season will stay stay training, stay fit. Um, for athletes, we consume anywhere between uh, four to six thousand calories a day to help us keep energy to maintain our training loads. Um, so yeah, in that sense, you can't really ever switch off. Uh, although in saying that, since we finished the Olympics, and that's our pinnacle event of living myself sort of three to four weeks of just hanging out mentally resetting and not always being conscious that i need to be eating the right foods or uh, maintaining uh, calories for training loads or getting up early to get two hours of cardio in. so i'm just resetting and letting the body recover mm -hmm. yeah well um, understandably um i mean it's also interesting reading a little bit about the, the way that you've you planned your your career i mean you know please tell me if that's the, the normal way of doing things but you've also in the meantime you know taken time out to take a you know, to continue your education um and you've also set up your own company so you know you, you're very much it seems driven not only sort of dedicated to your sport but also to your sort of self-development and improvement is it would that be fair to say yeah i think that is fair to say i um it's probably not the traditional pathway to get to an Olympic medal or in the elite New Zealand rowing team. I think uh, back when I was coming up through the ranks, there was a fear for athletes that if you didn't take trials or take opportunities to make representative teams, then uh, you'd be off the selectors radar and they might not invite you back for a trial or you might lose fitness or you're just not really in the program as such. But I was also quite aware that although I really enjoy rowing and I love the sport, um, there is a time when an athlete's career ends and that may not be by choice, whether it's through non-selection into a team or, or a season ending injury, that could, then that's just such a realistic thing that certainly can happen. So I was definitely aware of that and I decided that I needed to have some sort of a backup plan and that backup plan for me was tertiary education. So I did a Bachelor of Commerce at the University of Canterbury, majoring in accounting and finance. And I, I realized that if I did um, fall off the pace or get injured, then it wouldn't be uh, such a stressful move going from an athlete to uh, a corporate career or, or another avenue in life. And I had these this backup plan. And it also is, it's good for the mind as well to focus on something else because if you're just full-time studying or full-time rowing, it's a competitive environment and you can get quite caught up in the woodwork and um, it can be quite stressful. So if you don't have something else to dedicate your mind to, then it can, yeah, it might, you might not just get the performances that you want. Okay. okay. And, and the company that you've, you've set up, I mean, is it, how, how can you sort of balance the two um so, you know i suppose uh, activities yeah so the um the company that i set up was back at university in christchurch and that was to help me fund my representative uh rowing campaign so they might cost anywhere between four to six thousand new zealand dollars and i needed to find a way to sort of front that money and i it was awkward for me because i was training all the time so i couldn't be um, involved in like traditional nine to five employment on top of studying as well 
And so that was the pegboard company. And it was, um, we sold shelving units to uh, furniture retailers or like home and decor stores. Um, but since then that I haven't actually, we've sort of disbanded that company mainly because it got awkward when I moved back up to Cambridge and I didn't have quite the right facilities, but there's still other business opportunities out there. So a friend of mine, a roller as well, we um, started, we sell cherries in Cambridge or the Waikato region. So we might sell anywhere between uh, 1.3 to 1.5 tons of cherries just before Christmas. And that's good because it gives you, it, yeah, like, um, so it's a good cool. insight into how the business world operates and yeah and fresh produce distribution yeah it's brilliant i mean it's just great to see that um you, you've got these other plans uh, you know there uh, as it were to to fall back on um but i mean okay talking a little bit about, about the olympics again so you you've compared different kinds of competitions and um so you, you, you observed the sort of cutthroat element of the Olympics because it's quite a unique uh, tournament. But I mean, can you interact? Do you feel that you know, after all is said and done um, back in the village or in your sort of communal areas, is there a lot of uh, camaraderie between you? Between the athletes? Yeah. Yeah, I would certainly say so. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. It's quite, um, I guess only athletes will have this perspective on it. But before racing, you don't talk to any of your competitors because you're you're in the zone or whatever and you want to be a bit of a macho you know like you don't want to really interact because then it shows you're not that focused on your event but as soon as the racing is done although some guys might be really disappointed because they didn't get the performance that they wanted um sort of any time after the racing there is a really good sense of camaraderie and i'll shake hands with everyone and and yeah like i've touched base with guys from the great britain crew um a guy from the german crew so yeah i'd say we're all we're all mates and it's nice catching up with everyone and and it's also just interesting to see how how they do it and how they got to where they were as well because although we're in the same sport and we do the same thing everyone came up through a different pathway and background and it's, it's awesome to see all the different cultures and experiences that people came through and it's also great just seeing other athletes out there doing their thing because although I really enjoy rowing, it's a, it's a reasonably niche sport, uh, especially in New Zealand. Um, although I'm saying that we're actually, we're actually really good at it. Um, but it's just nice seeing other rowers out there doing their thing, um, pursuing what they like doing. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, did you perhaps encounter some people in, in, in Tokyo uh, with whom or against whom you'd competed uh, in some of the other tournaments? I mean, were there any recognizable faces for you? Yeah, there's heaps actually. We um, there's a lot of rowers that I've raced throughout the years. There was this one guy. His name is Charlie. We raced against each other in Hamburg, and then we raced against each other in uh, Pol oh, no, uh, Poland, and then uh, we're at Sarasota and Florida, and then we raced each other against each other at the Olympics. So that was quite cool. We're the same age, and we've sort of come up through the ranks on different pathways but ended at the same point which i thought was quite cool um there's another cool story uh and back in hawks bay where i live i was security at a women's hockey tournament and the argentinian hockey team came over and um there was a player there that my friends and i we got a photo with she was our favorite player of the tournament we took we had a bit of a crush on her i guess um <laughs> but then i was in the food hall getting some pizza and I looked at her and I thought I recognized her and it was the same hockey player only uh, eight years later kind of thing. So in that sense, it's just such a small world. And, and I think those are cool stories that make the Olympics so exciting. And, and although I'm really proud of our gold medal and, and what we achieved, that's what the Olympics are all about. It brings people together and it lets people express themselves through their sport and show the world what they love doing and then the world likes watching it. So I think that's a really cool aspect of it. Mm, yeah i mean did you uh, was it a little bit different to some previous tournaments because of the okay there weren't that many competitors oh sorry excuse me i should say there weren't that many spectators there um was there was did you feel there was something missing or was just the whole event was just so special anyway that you were that you know you you were inspired yeah although it was it was certainly different with no spectators probably the saddest thing about that was they had all these big grandstands and um 
lots of seating for all the spectators and they were just empty. So that was a wee bit unfortunate to see, but um, I think everyone was just so stoked that the Olympics went ahead after the postponement and Tokyo 2020, they just did such an exceptional job of um, organizing and administering it. Like the, the Japanese people are just such awesome, awesome people. Their culture is great. They're very polite, conscientious. Um, they go the extra mile. So in that sense, Japan did a fantastic job of organizing the Olympics. And that um, really was the cherry on top for A, it going ahead and B, they did it really well. So yeah, it was unfortunate that spectators went there, but I think everyone just had such a great time anyway. Mm. Yeah, um, I can imagine um, how it must have felt. Um, yeah, so also talking about, you know, before when you said that you had to sort of front up a certain amount of cash to, to be able to pursue your sport um, and with, you know, with the with the determination that you brought with it, of course. Um, and OK, you know that, uh, you know, Han contacted you via Briskby. So this is, uh, you know, the startup which likes to sort of circulate, um, you know, sporting equipment and so on. Um, do you think that kind of thing would also make it easier for sort of up and coming sports people, you know, to make uh, goods and so on, you know, more accessible um, so that the financial outlay um, isn't quite so hefty? Um, I mean, because technology is bringing these kinds of opportunities forward. Mm, yes, certainly. I guess, um, although I had to work to help fund campaigns, I was also in a privileged position where my family supported me a lot throughout. Um, when I came up through the sport, but not every family is like that. And there's certainly athletes out there that um, could be exceptional on the world stage, but they just might not have the same opportunities as other people. And the craziest thing is like, you just never know where the next Olympian is or, or where he's living or where he's growing up. And you just don't know what his, uh, his situation is like at home or, or um, his access and opportunities to sport. So yeah, if there was not a financial barrier and, uh, young kids could have more access to sport then I certainly think that would be beneficial in molding the future Olympians of today. Mm. And, um, and and when you mentioned that so the 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 team obviously behind uh, you know New Zealand um, and not only in in rowing but also in the other uh, sports disciplines that they they participated in um, I guess they're very supportive um, of younger athletes uh, they push um, they inspire they motivate they create opportunities yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, I think for the New Zealand team uh, competing at the Olympics, we had such great leadership and good camaraderie within the crew. Everyone pushes each other to the limits. And I, I think that's a fantastic part about our team. We had exceptional support staff throughout our whole journey. Um, they sort of cater to you hand on foot. You know, you could come at them any time of day with any sort of request and they'd they'd go out of their way to make it happen, which I think was what, which was such a cool thing about it. And it's great because they're there because they want to see you succeed and they put a lot of effort into it. And um, when you can pull off a decent performance, that just is the cherry on top. And it, I don't think it um, like uh, gratifies your journey, but it is just a nice cherry on top. And it just, yeah, I think it's just a cool thing about it. Okay. And uh, was there any specific or particular team that you really wanted to beat? Yeah, uh, um, I know that obviously <laughs> New Zealand and Australia. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't, well, obviously, I guess in that sense, you do want to beat all of them because you want to you want to have that gold medal around your neck. Um, but in saying that, I think the ones we were most aware of were definitely the the German, Germany, Great Britain, and the Dutch. They had all shown decent performances throughout the season. So they were the ones we were most aware of, especially Germany. I think they hadn't um they've been unbeaten for the last three years or four years even. And then they've only been beaten twice in a five-year period. So they were like they were the crew to beat. And yeah, we were most aware of them and we we knew they were going to be our biggest competition, I think. Okay. And um and now you guys are the team to beat. Does that does that add a bit to what you have to do in your next races? It certainly does, yeah. So I think I'm in a such an awesome position where the first Olympics I went to, we came home with a gold medal. I don't think that's that's super common, but I am aware that it can only go downhill from here. So <laughs> I'll I will 
yeah, although I'm having a break now, we will need to, um, when we start training again, we'll need to change things up and and make sure we are still on top of our game and and not getting complacent. But in saying that, if we win and raced and didn't win at our next event or at the next Olympic Games, although it would be I guess, a wee bit disappointing because we we had had a gold medal before, um, I don't think, or I might not be the only one, but we don't really race for the medals. It's a nice cherry on top, but if you look at our careers, it's like a cake, right? And the middle is the icing on top, but I'm proud of the cake and you can still eat cake. So I'm still happy with that. <laughs> and icing on itself isn't actually that nice either. So yeah, the um, I feel like the public and, and our country really love medals and fair enough as well, because it, it puts us on the world stage and it shows how competitive we are as a sporting nation. Um, but had we not medaled, I would have been not equally as happy, but I wouldn't have been devastated. You know, we still got to train together in the men's eight. We got to compete at the Tokyo Olympic games. That was sort of had a question mark about whether it was going to go ahead or not. Um, we have great camaraderie as a team. We formed relationships that will last us a lifetime. Um, I got to watch athletes at their pinnacle event um, on the world stage in person. And I saw some of the best athletes in the world at the Olympic village and I sort of had pizza next to the best skateboarder in the world, you know? So things like that, those are just such awesome experiences that um, that just that's just the nature of the Olympics, right? So yeah, our medal is cool and I'm, I'm, I'm stoked about it, but we had such an awesome experience outside of that as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you've more or less answered the question about what you're going to do next. Um, I mean, the next Olympics is in three years, so you don't have to wait too long uh, you know, for that uh, particular event. Um, but I mean, what is the kind of, at what age does a rower, an elite rower such as yourself, start to say, okay, I need to slow down here? I mean, how long can you keep going essentially normally? What yeah. Well, that's a great question. It kind of depends from athlete to athlete. Some people achieve their goals and that's it for them. And then they want to move on to the next chapter of life. Um, other guys want to keep going until they're, I think Mahe, he's a, he'd be one of New Zealand's best rowers, one of the world's best rowers ever. He went till he was 40. We have huh. Hamish Bond who was um, rowing at, he competed at 35 and he's a gold medalist at 35 years old and he has three kids. So it varies from athlete to athlete. Um, I'll probably be there until you'll probably see me in Paris. Um, that's because I'm 24. I'll be 27 in Paris. I've still got a few more good years in me. I enjoy the lifestyle and it's, yeah, I think it's the cool place to be. And it's, it's awesome to go over to New Zealand and represent your country and especially in what you love. And then coming back home and just seeing the smiles on your family's faces is, is such an awesome experience. And um, yeah, I don't think I will. Oh, yeah, I'm sure anything that we did, your family would be proud, but it's, it, sport's a cool thing. And, and my dad in particular, he, he loves rowing. So it's nice that we performed on the world stage and just he's given me so much. And actually my mother as well. They've both given me so much throughout my career and, and life. So it's nice to come home and, and give them some joy and help them celebrate in our success as well. And um, I mean, when you go down to the club um, or clubhouse and you see the, the, the younger kids who were basically maybe 12, about the same age as you were when you know, you were 15 when you started rowing, weren't you? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you see them uh, sort of young Tom McIntoshes um, and they, you're, you're a hero to them, obviously now. Um, yeah. How, how do how do you sort of take that reception from them? What do you say to them? Um, I just, just be yourself. It sounds cliche, you know, go for gold, dream big and then dream bigger. Um, <laughs> yeah, we actually haven't, um, been back to the Hawke's Bay Rowing Club or I haven't made it back to my hometown yet, but I imagine when we get back, oh, there'll, there'll be a wee bit of a reception when we get back there. Um, in terms of me, how we front that, it honestly is, it's as cliche as it sounds, but I dreamt as big as I could have for me, that was an Olympic gold medal and, now I've got one, so it, it does show it's possible. And I'm I'm just a guy from Hawke's Bay and I've got a, a nice family around me. And there's so many people in the exact same position that I was at home. So it, it really is that our future Olympians are everywhere. It's just a matter of, I guess, if we can inspire them with this gold medal, then that is certainly an obligation that I need to fulfill. So no, I'm excited about it. And I'm, I'm stoked that I can 
hopefully inspire some future kids to do what they love doing and pursue their dreams. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I couldn't be more complimentary towards you. I guess, I mean, as a Brit, um, we, we, we kind of grow up with a certain awareness um, of, uh, you know, Australians, New Zealanders, mainly because of the, the, the sporting interaction, if it's cricket or if it's rugby or something else. And, um, you know, people from New Zealand, sports people from New Zealand have always spoken well. Uh, they always seem very calm, uh, but extremely competitive. Um, uh, but at the same time, very humble um, in, in either victory or, or defeat. And do you think that's, you, you were talking before about what's important about the Olympics. Um, would you say your sort of typical New Zealand athlete embodies that in, in the way that they behave and the way that they, you know, they essentially you know, exude this particular kind of uh, approach to sport? Yeah, I think so. I think Kiwis, we do... Um we're always quietly competitive and being from a small island nation at the bottom of the world, I guess there is a sense of, of somewhat of a point to prove when we go up against the bigger nations like GB or Germany. Um, but yeah, I think we do, I guess we're humble in, in some aspects, although in saying that we did have a pretty big celebration when we crossed the line. So I don't know <laughs> if that was the most humble way about it, but Hey, that's all part of it. We celebrate our successes a lot of the time. And also um, if we, if we didn't win that race, then, that's totally fine with me as well because at the end of the day that crew was faster and there's there's things you can do about it before the race but there's nothing you can do about it during the race and and yeah so sorry to answer your question i guess we are um yeah that's probably something that you could probably comment on more than i can you know like you don't really notice how you interact with other nations it's more it's easy to see from the outside as, as opposed from the inside but all the yeah yeah yeah, I remember actually after the race, the um, the Germans and the Brits were understandably a wee bit disappointed, and I totally get that. But man, that was such an exciting race to be a part of, and it was hot, it was fast, it was an Olympic final, and although they didn't get the result that they wanted, um, I just think it was such a cool experience for me, I at least to be part of that race and to race against the best athletes in the world, and yeah i don't know if that like um consoles them or in any way but i that's just something that i've often thought um yeah they might not have the same mentality and i totally get that as well yeah brilliant tom what can i say um you are yeah, a wonderful representative of your sport um uh, but this you're already aware of you've got the gold medal to prove it um and, and you're also yeah a pleasure to talk to um so you know i, I thank you again uh on, on behalf of brisby for taking the time out um uh, and also for being so upfront and honest um in your your responses so uh yeah thank you very very much for taking part in this uh podcast Oh, good, Zach. Thank you for having me. That's actually perfect timing because my um, laptop has just given me a low battery sign. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, outside of that, though, thanks for having me. I'm glad I could um, share my story and give some insights as to what it's like being a professional athlete and what the Olympics Games were like. And, yeah, my views on what it's all about. And the Olympics brings people together. And that's just like we wouldn't be discussing right now if the Olympics hadn't gone ahead. So I think that's a pretty cool aspect of it. You're a Brit in Berlin doing a podcast. I'm a Kiwi <laughs> in a farm in North Canterbury. Like, how cool is that, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the perspectives that you you, you sort of uh, portray uh, in that are absolutely spot on. So, um, yeah, thank you again. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that we will uh, stay in touch. Um, I will communicate with you. And uh, so will Han um and uh, yeah we'll let you know everything that goes on with uh, with this podcast too as well so you'll be able to access it uh, whenever you wish fantastic zach thank you take care have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of your winter or yeah it's winter we had a frost it was about negative three this morning so it's pretty cold <laughs> okay all right well good luck with it take care tom thanks a lot very good bye see ya <laughs> There you go. Brilliant. See you, man. Bye. Two and a mic.